Awakening in the middle of a particularly loud snore, Scrooge sat up in bed to get his thoughts together. He didn't have to be told that the bell was once again nearing the stroke of one. He felt he'd woken up in the nick of time for the arrival of the second messenger Jacob Marley had arranged for him to meet. He was uncomfortably cold and began to wonder which of his curtains this new spirit would pull back. To eliminate the suspense, he pushed them all aside with his own hands, then lying down again began to scan the darkness around his bed. Because he wanted to challenge the spirit as soon as it appeared and did not wish to be taken by surprise again. Having seen how odd the first spirit looked, I can tell you that Scrooge was ready for any number of strange appearances and that nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have surprised him very much. What he was not prepared for was nothing. And consequently, when the bell struck one and no shape appeared, he became quite anxious. Five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes went by, yet nothing came. Yet as Scrooge lay upon his bed, he was in the very centre of a blaze of light which had appeared the instant the clock had struck the hour. And somehow, being only light, it was more alarming than a dozen spirits, and he was powerless to make out what it meant. At last, however, he began to think that the source and secret of this light might be in the adjoining room, from where, on further inspection, it seemed to shine. So he got up slowly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the knob, a strange voice called him by his name. Scrooge. The door opened, and it was his own room. There was no doubt about that but it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with evergreen that it looked like a grove, from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there. And such a mighty blaze went roaring up the fireplace as that seldom used hearth had ever known in Scrooge's time, or Marley's or for many and many a winter before. Piled up on the floor to form a kind of throne were roast turkeys, geese, venison, chicken, huge slabs of beef, whole roasted pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of red-hot chestnuts, ripe apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, extravagantly decorated cakes, and seething bowls of punch that filled the chamber with their delicious steam. Relaxing upon this feast of a couch, there sat a jolly giant who bore a glowing torch shaped like a horn of plenty. He held it up, high up, to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door, head bowed and squinting, for he couldn't bring himself to look the giant in the eyes. Come in, come in, and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Lift your eyes and look at me. Scrooge reverently did so and saw that the spirit was clothed in one simple green robe bordered with white fur, which hung so loosely on him that its chest was bare. Its feet, visible beneath the ample folds of the garment, were also bare, and on its head it wore a crown of holly set here and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free. Its face shone with joy. Its eyes sparkled. Its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained manner added to its joyful air. Girded round its middle was an antique scabbard, but no sword was in it. And the ancient sheath was covered with rust. You have never seen the like of me before. Never? I've never walked with any of my elder brothers. I don't think I have. I, I'm afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, Spirit? More than 1,800. A tremendous family to provide for. The ghost of Christmas present rose. Spirit, take me where you will. I went with the last Spirit because it compelled me and I learned a lesson which is still working on me now. If you have something to teach me, 
Let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. The room and everything in it vanished instantly and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning. The weather was severely cold and the people made a brisk and not unpleasant kind of music in scraping the snow from the pavement in front of their dwellings and from the tops of their houses. A group of boys rejoiced to see it come plopping down into the road below and splitting into artificial little snowstorms. The dirtier snow upon the ground had been ploughed up in deep furrows by the heavy wheels of carts and wagons, furrows that crossed and recrossed each other hundreds of times where the great streets branched off and made intricate channels hard to trace in the thick yellow mud and icy water. The sky was gloomy, and the streets were choked up with a dingy fog, as if all the chimneys in England had caught fire and were blazing away to their dear heart's content. There was nothing very cheerful in the climate or the town, and yet there was an air of cheerfulness abroad as though the clearest summer air and brightest summer sun might not have been able to conjure. For the people who were shoveling away on the housetops were full of smiles, calling out to one another and tossing the occasional snowball, laughing heartily if it hit home, and no less heartily if it didn't. The poulterers' shops were still half open, and the produce shops were radiant in their glory. There were huge, round baskets of chestnuts. There were pears and apples clustered high in blooming pyramids. Bunches of grapes dangling from hooks, causing people's mouths to water as they passed. The oranges and lemons, bright and juicy, begged to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. Oh, the grocers! Oh, the grocers! Nearly closed, with perhaps two shutters down, or one, but through those gaps, such sights. The scales descending on the counter made a merry sound, the twine and butcher paper rolled out briskly, and the canisters were rattled up and down by the grocers like juggling tricks. The scents of tea and coffee were so pleasing to the nose, the raisins were so plentiful, the sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, the other spices so delicious. The candied fruits so caked and spotted with molten sugar as to make the coldest onlookers feel faint. The figs were fresh. The French plums promised perfect tartness in their highly decorated boxes. Everything was good to eat and in its Christmas dress. But the customers were all so hurried and so eager in the hopeful promise of the day that they tumbled up against each other at the door, crashing their baskets wildly and forgetting their purchases upon the counter and running back to fetch them all while keeping the best of moods. But soon the church bells called good people all to church and chapel, and they came, flocking through the streets in their best clothes and with their happiest faces. After this, there emerged scores of people carrying their dinners to various gatherings. These revelers appeared to interest the spirit very much. He would lift the covers off the dishes as the bearers passed and sprinkle something on their dinners from his torch. It was a very uncommon kind of torch, for once or twice, when there were angry words between some dinner carriers who had bumped into each other, he shed a few drops of water on them from it, and their good mood was restored, for they said it was a shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day. And so it was, God love it, so it was. Is there a particular flavour in what you sprinkle from your torch? There is, my own. Would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day? To any kindly given, to a poor one most. Why to a poor one the most? Because it needs it most. They went on, invisible as they had been before, into the suburbs of the town. It was a remarkable quality of the ghost that, despite his gigantic size, he could enter into any place with ease. With Scrooge holding to his rope, he stopped on the threshold of a door. The spirit smiled and blessed the dwelling with the sprinkling of his torch. Then, taking a step forward, Scrooge found himself inside the house. Do you know this place? I do not. It is the home of your clerk, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was astonished. Cratchit earned but fifteen shillings a week, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed house. Mrs. Cratchit... Dressed in a worn gown, dressed up in ribbons, which are cheap and make a good show for sixpence, laid the tablecloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also adorned in ribbons. 
while Master Peter Cratchit, the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bod's own collar, loaned to his eldest son in honour of the day, nearly swallowing his chin, plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes to see if they were done. Two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that they had smelled the goose. Basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table and complimented Master Peter on his grown-up shirt collars, which nearly choked him as the slow potatoes bubbled up, knocking loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peel. Whatever could be keeping your precious father and your brother Tiny Tim? And Martha weren't as late last Christmas Day by half an hour. Oh, Mother, here's Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are. We had a deal of work to finish up last night and had to clear away this morning, Mother. Well, never mind, you're here now. Sit you down by the fire, my dear, and have a warm-up, Lord bless you. No, no, Father's coming. Hide, Martha, hide. So Martha hid herself, and in came Bob, with at least three feet of comforter, not counting the fringe, hanging down, and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable. Tiny Tim was upon his shoulder, holding a little crutch, his limbs supported by an iron frame. Ooh, where is our Martha? <sighs> not coming, dear. But not coming? Uh, not coming from Christmas Day? Martha did not like to see him disappointed, even if it was a joke, so she came out from behind the closet door and ran into his arms while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim off to hear the pudding bubbling in the copper. And how did little Tim behave? (laughs) As good as gold and better. Somehow he gets so thoughtful, sitting by himself so much, and thinks the strangest things you've ever heard. He he told me, coming home, he said he hoped the people saw him in church. Uh, Because he was a cripple... And it might be pleasant for them to, you know, remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and the blind to see. Tiny Tim's active little crutch was heard on the floor and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool before the fire. Bob, meanwhile, stirred some hot mixture in a jug and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose the rarest of all birds. And in truth, it was something very rare in that house. Mrs. Cratchit brought the gravy, Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigour, Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce, Martha got the plates, Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table, The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, shoving spoons into their mouths, waiting their turn to be served. At last, the dishes were set on, and grace was said. Then there was a breathless pause, as Mrs. Cratchit prepared to plunge the carving knife into the bird. When she did, and the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, One murmur of delight arose all around the table, and even Tiny Tim beat on the table with the handle of his knife and cried, Hurrah! (laughs) I don't believe there ever was a goose cooked better. So tender and so flavourful. And how you were able to purchase such a bird with so meagre a budget is a credit to your own skills as a keeper of the house. Accompanied by the applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family, and everyone had had enough. The youngest Cratchits, in particular, were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone to fetch the pudding up and bring it in. In half a minute she was back, smiling proudly, with the pudding perfectly done, ablaze with ignited brandy, and garnished with a Christmas holly stuck into the top. (laughs) A wonderful pudding. Uh, Perhaps the greatest success you've achieved, my dear, since our marriage. Now that it's turned out... I confess, I had my doubts. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. It would have been heresy to do so. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was all done, the table cleared, the hearth swept and the fire made up. The compound in the jug was tasted and considered perfect. Apples and oranges were put upon the table and a shovelful of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth, in what Bob Cratchit called a circle. At Bob's elbow stood the family display of glasses, 
two tumblers, and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have, and Bob served it out with beaming looks while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and cracked noisily. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us, everyone. Tiny Tim sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand as if he thought that if he let it go, Tiny Tim might be taken from him. Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. No, no. Oh, no, kind spirit. Say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race will find him here. But if he is going to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit and was overcome with penitence and grief. Man, if man you are in heart... Do not presume to know who should or should not die, or that you know best what the surplus is and where it is. It may be that in the sight of heaven, you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. Oh, to hear the insect feasting on the leaf passing judgment on his hungry brothers in the dust. Scrooge bent before the ghost's rebuke and, trembling, cast his eye upon the ground. But he raised them speedily on hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge. To Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon. And I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, the, the children is... Christmas Day. You want us to drink to the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge? You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you, poor fellow. My dear, Christmas Day. (sighs) I'll drink to his health for your sake in the days, not his. Long life to him, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her, but there was no heartiness in it. Tiny Tim drank last of all, but he didn't care two pence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for full five minutes. After a few minutes passed, they were ten times merrier than before from the mere relief of being done with Scrooge. Bob Cratchit told them how he had a job opportunity for Master Peter, which, if he got it, would bring in a full five and sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars, as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should make with that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice at a milliner's, then told them what kind of work she had to do and how many hours she worked at a stretch and how she meant to stay in bed tomorrow morning for a good long rest, tomorrow being a holiday. All this time the chestnuts in the jug went round and round and by and by they had a song about a lost child travelling in the snow from Tiny Tim who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from waterproof Their clothes were scanty, and Peter very likely knew the inside of a pawnbroker's shop. But they were glad to be together, happy, grateful, and content, and looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch as the spirit and Scrooge left. Scrooge had his eye on them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. By this time it was getting dark and snowing pretty heavily, And as Scrooge and the spirit went along the streets, the brightness of the roaring fires in kitchens, parlours and all sorts of rooms was wonderful. The flickering of the blaze showed preparations for a cosy dinner, with hot plates baking through and through before the fire, and deep red curtains ready to be drawn to shut out the cold and darkness. Children were running out into the snow to meet their married sisters, brothers, cousins, uncles and aunts, 
and to be the very first to greet them. If you had judged from the numbers of people on their way to friendly gatherings, you might have thought that no one was at home to welcome them when they got there. Instead of every house expecting company and piling up its fires half chimney high. And how the spirit exulted. How it opened its generous hand and floated on, pouring its bright and harmless mirth on everything within its reach. Then without a word of warning from the spirit, they stood upon a bleak and desert moor. Well, huge piles of rude stone were scattered about, as though it were the burial place of giants. The ground was covered in frost, and nothing grew but moss and firs and coarse grass. Down in the west, the setting sun had left a streak of fiery red which glared upon the desolation for an instant, then sank lower, lower, lower yet, until it was lost in the thick gloom of darkest night. What place is this? A place where miners live, who labor in the bowels of the earth. But even here, they know me. A light shone from the window of a hut, and they moved towards it. Passing through the wall of mud and stone, they found a cheerful group assembled round a glowing fire. An old, old man and woman with their children and their children's children and another generation beyond that, all decked out in their holiday best. The old man, in a voice that seldom rose above the howling of the wind, was singing them a Christmas song. It had been a very old song when he was a boy, and they all joined in the chorus. Suddenly Scrooge found himself passing above them all, quickly speeding out to sea. To Scrooge's horror, looking back, he saw the last of the land disappear as the sea rolled and roared and raged beneath them. Built upon a dismal reef of sunken rocks some league or so from shore, there stood a solitary lighthouse. Great heaps of seaweed clung to its base, and storm birds rose and fell about it, skimming the waves. But even here, two men who watched the lighthouse had made a fire that through the window and the thick stone wall shed out a ray of brightness on an angry sea. Joining their calloused hands over the rough table at which they sat, they wished each other Merry Christmas. Then the elder, with his face all wrinkled and scarred with hard weather, as the figurehead of an old ship might be, struck up a sturdy song. Again the ghost sped on above the black and heaving sea until far away from any shore they landed on a ship. They stood beside the helmsman at the wheel, the lookout in the bow, the officers who had the watch and others at their stations. Every man among them hummed a Christmas tune or had a Christmas thought or spoke below his breath to his companion of some bygone Christmas day. And every man on board, waking or sleeping, good or bad, had had a kinder word for another on that day than on any day in the year, and had shared to some extent in its festivities, and had remembered those he cared for at a distance, and had known that they thought kindly of him. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, while seeing these things, to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew's and to find himself suddenly in a bright, dry, gleaming room with the spirit standing smiling by his side and looking approvingly at that same nephew. It is fair to say that while there is infection in disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter. When Scrooge's nephew laughed in this way, holding his sides and twisting his face into the most extravagant contortions, Scrooge's niece, by marriage, laughed as heartily as did their friends. <laughs> he said that Christmas was a humbug, as I live. And he believed it too. Truthfully, he is a funny old man. And not so pleasant as he should be. However, his cantankerousness carries its own punishment. And I have nothing against him. His wealth is of no use to him. He doesn't do anything with it. He doesn't make himself comfortable with it. And he certainly hasn't the satisfaction of benefiting anyone else with it. I have no patience with him. I have. I am sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his bad temper? Himself, always. Here, he, he takes it into his head 
to dislike us. And he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence then? The consequence of his taking a dislike to us and not making merry with us is that he loses some pleasant moments, which could do him no harm. I am sure he loses better company than he can find in his own thoughts, either in his moldy old office or his dusty chambers. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail against Christmas till he dies, but he'll find me going there in good temper year after year and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If all it accomplishes is that he leave this poor clerk 50 pounds, that is something. And I think I shook him yesterday. It was their turn to laugh now at the idea of his shaking Scrooge. After tea, they had some music, for they were a musical family. Scrooge's niece played the piano well and played, among other tunes, a simple little tune which Scrooge recognized as a favorite of Fred's mother when she was a child. When this strain of music sounded, all the things that the spirit had shown him came to his mind. He softened more and more and thought that if he would have listened to it more often years ago, he might have cultivated the kindness of life his sister had. Perhaps he'd have been happier than the man who labored all those years next to Jacob Marley. After a while, they played Blind Man's Bluff, for it is good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas when Christ himself was a child. Now, I no more believe that Fred's friend Topper was really blind than I believe he had eyes in his boots. My opinion is that it was a plan between him and Scrooge's nephew and that the ghost of Christmas present knew it. The way he went after that attractive girl in the lace was obvious. Knocking things over, tumbling over the chairs, bumping into the piano, smothering himself among the curtains. Wherever she went, there he went. He always knew where she was and wouldn't catch anybody else. If you had fallen up against him, as some of them did on purpose, he would have pretended to grab at you and instantly moved off in the direction of the girl in lace. Fred's wife was sitting in a large chair in a snug corner where the spirit and Scrooge were close behind her as a game of charades began. There might have been 20 people there, young and old, but they all played. And so did Scrooge forgetting that he could be neither seen nor heard. He sometimes shouted his guests quite loud and very often guessed quite right, too. The spirit was greatly pleased to find him in this mood. When the spirit said it was time to leave, Scrooge protested. They've started a new game. Let us stay just one half hour more. It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something and the rest must guess what it was. But Fred could only answer their questions yes or no. The brisk fire of questions revealed that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, rather a disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes and talked sometimes and lived in London and walked about the streets and wasn't led by anybody and didn't live in a zoo and was not a horse or a cow or a bull or a tiger or a dog or a pig or a cat or a bear... At every fresh question, Fred burst into a fresh roar of laughter. (laughs) At last, Fred's wife cried out. Fred! Fred! I know what it is! It's your Uncle Scrooge! (laughs) Yes! The old hermit himself! And it would be ungrateful not to drink his health. Raise your glasses to Uncle Scrooge. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, uh, whatever he is. He wouldn't take it from me, but may he have it nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge! Scrooge had become so light-hearted that he would have thanked them all if the ghost had given him time. But the whole scene passed in the breath of the last word spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again off on their travels. Much they saw, and far they went. In many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful. By struggling men, and they were filled with greater hope. 
in poor houses, hospitals, and jails, in misery's every refuge where vain man had not made locked the door and barred the spirit out. At each stop he left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. It was a long night, and Scrooge noted that while he remained unaltered, the ghost grew clearly older. Scrooge had observed this change, but never spoke of it until they left a children's party, and he noticed that its hair was completely grey. Our spirits' lives so short? My life upon this globe is very brief. It ends tonight, and the time is drawing near. Forgive me, but I see something strange sticking out, protruding from under your robe. Is it a foot or a claw? It might be a claw from the flesh there is upon it. Look here. From the foldings of its robe, the spirit brought two children. They knelt down at its feet and clung to the outside of its garment. It was a boy and a girl, yellow, sickly, thin and ragged. Where graceful youth should have filled their features out, a stale and shriveled hand like that of age had pinched and twisted them. Where angels might have sat enthroned, devils lurked. Look down here, man. Scrooge was startled at the sight. They are mankind. The boy is ignorance. The girl is want. Beware them both and all of their kind. But most of all, beware this boy, for on his brow is written doom. Have they no refuge or resource? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Scrooge again heard his own words ringing in his ears as the bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked around for the ghost, but he had disappeared. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, he saw a solemn spirit in a dark hooded robe coming toward him, like a mist along the ground. The third of four episodes of A Christmas Carol, presented by The Joy FM, adapted from Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol by Dave Cruz, directed by Dave Cruz and Chris Byerly, voice work by Dave Cruz, Chris Byerly, Alicia Byerly, Eason Byerly, Sarah Castor, Ashley Roberts, and Jake Dempsey. Sound design by Chris Byerly. Music and Foley effects from Epidemic Sound. Don't miss an episode. Listen wherever you listen to podcasts.